You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. The scripture passage for today is, the, is from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you, will, you who will receive good things from my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those who are righteous will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Recently, there have been a number of studies uh, done by different universities, done by different journals of mental and sociological education on particularly the subject of altruism. So some of you remember this from high school. Let's like sort of go all the way back, right, to ninth grade. Altruism is this. It is the study, it is the sort of idea uh, that um, the more altruistic you are means you have a higher likeliness, a higher willingness to help another person in need, whether you know them or not. And so a lot of these groups are doing these different studies on altruism. They're trying to figure out what makes someone more or less willing to help another person in need out in the world. And they found, at least according to one study, they found the single greatest determining factor as to whether or not you or I are altruistic people. You ready for it? I don't think you are. Are you ready for it? So the single greatest determining factor as to how altruistic you are corresponded with simultaneously how cynical you are. This conversation got a lot less fun, didn't it? Yeah, it was just, just in a minute and a moment, right? Uh, the conclusion was super simple. Uh, they found that in studying these folks and following these folks and how they engaged in work and with their neighbors and their friends, they found that the more cynical you are, the less likely are you are to help, which makes sense, right? If you're more cynical, then that means you are less likely to sort of give other people the benefit of the doubt, to assume positive intent. If you walk around cynical all the time, that means you're walking around with a very negative, pessimistic understanding of humanity. And so when you find them in trouble, you walk away going, well, they probably deserved it. The more cynical you are, the less likely you are to help. And the inverse is also true. The less cynical you are, the more likely those folks were to help. And I can pick on y'all or pick on the world as much as we want, but when applied to my own life, this also checks out. Um, This summer, we've been traveling and done some vacationing and such, and I've been doing a little bit of golf because uh, apparently I hate my free time. And uh, on the golf course, I have found this to be true that uh, more often than not, I consider myself someone who I try really hard to help other people. I don't, especially at golf, I want to help other people when they're looking for, they left one of their golf clubs or they lost their golf ball. Like, I'll stop my round and try to help them. Why? Um, Because I've been there. Uh, In fact, I'm there all the time. And so, quite frankly, I'm really always willing to jump in and help unless you're a particular type of golfer. 
then my cynicism increased dramatically, uh, dr dramatically. And particularly the type of golfer I'm talking about is the unsolicited coacher. You guys been around these people before? Been around these people before? I kid you not, a year ago I got paired with one of these. And uh, we're out there and every single hole he's watching me play. So I'm super self-conscious about it and he's offering all these tips. He's like, well, you really just need to adjust your stance and you need to adjust your swing. <laughs> and so after about like the seventh hole, I'm hating every minute of this. Uh, and so he offers me coaching on mine and then he walks up. It's a water hole and he walks up and he smashes his ball right into the lake. And friends, the amount of joy <laughs> that filled my system is actually probably something I need to confess. And so, Lord, we're here and we're asking for your forgiveness here today. Please forgive us. We do know what we do. We know not what we do. It's an interesting finding. It's an interesting finding uh, that the more cynical, are, so cynical you are, the less likely you are to help and vice versa. Especially, it's a really interesting finding and a very interesting conversation to have in here, in places like this. Why? Because, I don't know, last time I checked, you are here, you are amongst people for whom this is actually supposed to be our calling card. This is actually supposed to be one of the hallmark definition and symbols of what it means to be a Christian, that Christians, if you know nothing else, they are people that when they see a need, when they see someone who needs help, when they see a crisis, we are the people who are supposed to run to those situations. But what's fascinating about that finding, that, that study I just told you about, is Christians actually didn't perform any better than the average person out in the world. They found that it actually wasn't your beliefs about God that made you a more altruistic person. It was your beliefs about one another. And so... Due to all of those findings, it seemed very, very timely that this morning what we're going to do uh, is we're actually going to continue our sermon series that we've been in for the last several weeks. And so if this is your first time here with us. All summer long, we've been doing this sort of fun sermon series called The Gospel in Disney. We've been sort of looking at the parallels and the themes found both in our Gospels and in sort of like the gospel proclaimed in Disney movies. And so today, uh, I think it's really, really timely, really, really appropriate that we ask the question of what... what not only can our faith teach us, but what can Disney teach us so as to avoid being these cynical people who don't get involved in helping with the world's issues? What might our faith and Disney teach us about how to avoid being the other group in our scripture passage for today? So, let's dig in. If you have your Bibles with you and you want to go ahead and locate those and follow along, go ahead and do so. If you're watching this online, feel free to hit pause and uh, locate a device and go back to Matthew chapter 25. This is uh, here in Matthew 25. Matthew is one of the Gospels, and so it talks about Jesus specifically. It's talking about uh, sort of the biography of Jesus, giving a sort of linear, uh, sort of a chronicling account of his different ministry and his sermons and his messages. But what's fascinating is here in Matthew chapter 25, scholars actually, uh, they categorize this particular section of writing very differently. They categorize this as apocalyptic writing. Most of the Gospels are narrative writing. This is the narrative, this is the type of writing you're used to. You tell a story. There's a protagonist, an antagonist, there's events, there's a, you know, conflict, that sort of thing. But here in Matthew chapter 25, most scholars say this is, no, this is apocalyptic writing. This belongs in the same category as Revelation, these scriptures that tell us about what we can anticipate in the life to come. Why? Because here in Matthew chapter 25, what Jesus does is Jesus paints a picture of one of the conversations you and I are going to have when we pass from this life to the next. I like to say it this way. This is one of these beautiful moments where Jesus kind of gives us the answers to the test ahead of time, right? He says this, he says, one of the conversations, just to anticipate, so I'm not going to surprise you, just so you know it's coming, one of the conversations to anticipate is going to be around uh, persons who are hungry, persons who are thirsty, strangers, those who are in prison, those who are sick. And one of the conversations that he forecasts is he's going to have this conversation with people. He's going to go, oh my gosh, like, thank you so much for welcoming me when I was hungry, welcoming me when I was thirsty. And there's this really funny scene uh, that he's sort of forecasting where the group of people that he's talking to are completely confused. Like, what? I, I don't remember seeing you hungry at any of those sort of places. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, I know. When you've done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, 
You didn't know it, but you were actually doing it for me. And so what does Jesus mean here? In very, very simple terms, here's what he's saying. He's saying that one of the conversations, one of the questions to anticipate from Jesus when you pass from this life to the next is this. Did you help? Did you help? Well, let me show you like all the things that I believe and all the cool studies and knowledge and stuff I unpacked. Yeah, yeah, we'll come to that, Jesus will say. But did you help? When you saw someone in your neighborhood, in your, uh, where you work, or out in the community in some sort of need, did you open your heart to them? Or did you batten that thing down? Did you shut that thing down? Did you pretend you didn't know about it so you didn't have to get involved? And what's so fascinating about what Jesus is doing here is a really, really cool move. He's doing a really, really cool move. You see, what he's doing here is by locating sort of these questions in the now. What he's doing is, is he's flipping our understanding of heaven, our understanding of the life to come. You see, oftentimes, when we think about the life to come, we pose it as a would you question. We think that God's going to ask us a would you question. Like, well, Kyle, would you help someone who is hungry? Would you help someone who is thirsty? God doesn't ask us that question. Why? Because every single one of us are going to say yes. We're going to go, yeah, absolutely. I would drop everything to help. I know I would. Jesus says, yeah, yeah, like I'm not going to ask that question. I'm going to ask you an are you question. Yeah, 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 would you, would you, whatever. Are you right now? Are you? What he's doing here in this moment is he's expanding, he's exploding our understanding of heaven and hell and this whole afterlife concept, he's exploding it to say, this is not something in the future. This reality has already begun. And the type of life that you're living actually is the clearest indicator. Your responsiveness, your willingness to help other people in need is, the, is a much clearer indicator as to which world you are living in which reality you prefer to inhabit. And so, friends, that's the question I want us to grapple with today. That's the question I want us to wrestle with today, which is which reality, which realm have I been living in more or less lately? Now, some of you, when you hear that question, like, good Lord, I don't know. Like, how how am I supposed to figure that out? Well, one way, one way, one part of that, one parcel of that is asking yourself this question. Not would you, but are you stepping up and stepping in to help whenever you encounter people in need? Now, that are you question, there's some sub-questions to it. So let's break it apart a little bit. Let's break it apart a little bit. In order to figure out whether or not uh, we have been or are willing to be altruistic people who are jumping in and Christians who are willing to jump in and get involved and help other people in need, the are you question, the first piece of that, (laughs) in order to answer yes, the first piece of that is this question, Are you even available to do so? Are you even able to do so? Are you available to help the people that you come across and need who need some sort of aid, some sort of support? Or or is your life so busy, so overcommitted, so strung out with different activities and commitments and responsibilities that Jesus could walk into your office tomorrow with a sign that says, I'm here from the future, and you'd say, hold on one second, I got some emails to get to. A couple years ago, I'd I'd led this uh, sort of like uh, preaching breakout for brand new preachers who are leaving seminary and they're going into various contexts. Some are going into urban context, some rural context, some suburban context. And I was in that conversation, I said, listen, one of the things that's going to help you the most in your preaching is understanding your context, the the particular people you're going to go minister with. And on top of that, you need to understand what are the primary spiritual dangers in each of those locations. I showed them this graph. So if you are going into an urban setting, one of the things that you need to know is that one of the spiritual dangers of that space is ambition. That's what could be one of the things that keeps people, that obstructs people the most from a relationship with God. This desire to climb, this desire to succeed, this desire to keep up with the people around them. 
And at the bottom, I said, some of you are going into rural settings. Some of you are going into some rural churches where they've been doing the same thing for the last 40 years, every Sunday in, every Sunday out. And so one of the things that you need to know is that one of the spiritual dangers in those places that you're going to have to confront, that you're going to have to overcome, is this nostalgia, this, oh, like, we just want, we, this was the golden era of our church, and this was the golden era of my relationship with God. If I could just get back to that, that's where the good stuff is. And then I got a chance to preach or uh, teach uh, the people who are entering contexts like mine. And I said, the single greatest difficulty, the greatest spiritual danger of following Jesus and trying to invite people to follow Jesus with you in suburban spaces is just the sheer level of unavailability your people will have for anything Jesus wants to say, anything Jesus wants to do, in them or through them. It reminded me, back to our sermon series, of one of my favorite Disney movies, Wally. Wally. How many of you have seen Wally before? Okay. I'll give you a quick synopsis for those who have not. Uh, the Earth is a dump heap. Okay. Uh, it's a dump heap. Uh, it's, it's somewhere in the future. We've abandoned Earth. It's this sort of scorched, apocalyptic scene. Everything is just sort of garbage and trash. And actually, human beings have left it. They quit on it. So they get on this sort of like space cruise ship, and they leave Earth. And they leave on Earth robots like Wally. And Wally's single job, single purpose of existence is to clean up trash. Eventually, he leaves Earth and he finds all these humans who for hundreds of years have been just sort of traveling around on this sort of like space cruise ship. And we find that in response to all the issues of Earth, the response of these humans in this movie was to spend the rest of their existence on these sort of like hovering uh, lazy boys eating tons of food. And what I assume what they're doing is watching Netflix. <laughs> and it's one of those scenes in a Disney movie that you watch with your kids and you laugh and you giggle. And then the longer it unfolds, the bigger the pit that starts in your stomach. It's interesting to me how what we watch unfold in this movie is a reflection of so often our response to all of the world's issues. So often, I don't know about you, but there's a, a huge temptation inside of me that whenever the world is getting worse or people are suffering around me, there's a temptation to just want to escape. And each of us have our own strategies for that, right? So for some of you, it's Netflix. For some of you, it's entertainment. For some of you, it's work. For some of you, it's just activity. If I can just cram my calendar with as much activity, there's no margins ever, then I never have to hear anything difficult to hear. I never have to be exposed to anything that's too difficult to sort of feel. And so if I just stay sort of locked in, I never have to feel it, think about it, or be exposed to it. And listen... So full, all the cards on the table, I enjoy a good Netflix binge fest just as much as the next person, okay? But what I'm finding to be true of my own life and what we're finding to be true of the human experience was captured really, really well by sociologist Brene Brown. Brene Brown had this to say about the danger of escapism. So this reaction to the world's issues and your life's problems by just escaping or numbing in some way. She says, the only problem with that strategy is it is literally impossible. There is no such thing as selective escaping. Meaning, when you decide that whenever life gets hard, you're just going to find means to numb yourself or ways to escape from reality, the problem is you're escaping from both the harmful, destructive things, the harmful, destructive people, and also all the people that you're supposed to help. All the innocent people that God sent your direction who need your care. They need you to get involved. The problem with this strategy is that you now can't even tell the difference anymore between the people you're supposed to versus not supposed to help. You treat all of them as a nuisance. You treat all of them as an inconvenience. You write all of them off. And back to our scripture passage for today. Jesus walks away from you with them.
And so I think the, the, the crux of this is, the finding of this is, is that escaping can't be the strategy. Making boundaries is the strategy. Amen? What you need is not to escape. What you need is boundaries. We'll come to more of that in a moment. So the first question of if I want to find myself, and I really do, oh, I really do, when I reach the end of uh, my life and I sit with Jesus, I want to be a part of like that sort of, sort of dumbfounded, foolish group that's like, wow, sweet, I, that was you at Starbucks? Awesome. Like, I really want to be a part of that group that gets shocked and surprised into realizing that I stepped up to help people in need, not even knowing it was Jesus in disguise. The first question you're going to have to answer is, number one, are you even available to do so right now? Second question is this. Second question you're going to have to really sit with and grapple with and apply to your life is not necessarily, are you available, but additionally, are you close enough? Are you close enough? Some of you are sitting here and you're like, oh, that's actually not, that wasn't my problem. Like, that wasn't my issue. I've, I actually have some good margins in my life. I've got space to breathe and to reflect and to sit with and to be open to other people who might need my assistance, who might be Jesus in disguise that day. The problem is not availability. My problem is proximity. Simply by way of where I live, where I work, where I shop, where I hang out. I'm just never really encountering a ton of people who are in need. So you begin to see that, friends, sometimes, sometimes intentionally, but most of the time, unintentionally, you are creating space between yourself and the people who God is trying to send your path who need your help. This is the story of the Good Samaritan, right? The story of the Good Samaritan, there's a man who's been beaten up, he's been mugged, he's been left in a ditch. And the two people who come across his path first are religious people, good Christian folk like you and me. And what do they do? This is, some of you read the story, you know the story. What do they do when they see the man, when they come up, what do they do? They cross the street. Sometimes I wonder what the contemporary version of crossing the street is. Oh, I got, I got, I got, I got work. I got, I got a thing, a really important thing at work. It's like, I can't really do that. I'm just going to avoid this sort of uh, person because every time I'm around them, I feel like they need something from me. We do this intentionally. We do this unintentionally. We decrease the proximity. We do exactly what opposite of what the good Samaritan does in the story, who runs to the man who he has found ill, beaten, broken, about to die. Back to Disney. This is why we all need Judy from Zootopia in our lives. Amen? Amen? Anybody seen Zootopia? Okay, any fans? I love how every time I ask these questions, it's always the same people. Young adults, young families are just like, yep! <laughs> Watched it 47 times last week. Thank you for bringing that back up. But Judy uh, is one of the protagonists of this movie, and she's this little uh, humble bunny who has this aspiration to be a police officer. And one of the things that I love so much about her character is any time and every time there's trouble, any time and every time someone's being mistreated, any time and every time someone is in need of help or support, you can see what she's doing. She's running to them. Not pretending she didn't hear it. Not pretending she didn't, wasn't aware of it. She runs to it. And quite frankly, one, one scene, she actually sees someone getting bullied and runs to the scene, confronts the people enacting this harm. Now, naturally, the next question that uh, sort of bubbles up in your brain or you have for me is, you know, Kyle, I hear you, dude. Like, I hear you. Like, I want to be that type of Christian who is running to the problems, running to the places where God needs hope and light and love. Like, I want to run to those places. But, like, what if I get hurt? Seriously. What if I get physically hurt, emotionally hurt? What if I get betrayed? What if I get taken advantage of? What if it all goes wrong? Have you thought about that? Like, what if something like that happens to me? And you want to know what? It could. Those of you who've seen that movie, uh, Judy gets beat up real bad uh, in the next season when she confronts all of those bullies. It's not like it just sort of like supernaturally she avoids it. I think Jesus knows a little something about that. But I think where I'm at in my life is 
I've come to realize something. I've come to realize that when it comes to safety, this idea of safety, wanting to live a safe life, safe from harm, safe from being hurt, safe of uh, being taken advantage of, I'm beginning to find that this is actually the reality. The reality is that, friends, there are going to be circumstances in your life. There are going to be situations in your life where the spiritually safe option is not the physically safe option. And simultaneously, the physically safe option is actually the spiritually dangerous option. Looking at that first one, spiritual safety equaling physical risk. Good Lord, this is just about every single story in the Bible. Moses, David, Jesus, Paul, Peter, the spiritual safe option, the option that was most faithful to God, most faithful to being the people that God wanted them to be, just about every single time came at a cost of something. There's no way around it. And simultaneously, we watch this unfold as well. We watch persons in Scripture opt for the physically safety, physically safe route. The rich young ruler. Jesus says, give up all of your possessions and follow me. He's like, yeah, I ain't going to do that. Feels a little too unsafe. And he walks away. The Bible's chocked full of examples like this. And so, friends, I don't care how many Christian coffee shops you go to where they've got, like, the nice little mugs and the tote bags and the shirts that talk about, like, the warm and fuzzy Jesus. I don't care how many places you visit. I'm here to remind you that following Jesus is not always the safe option. It's the best option. It leads to goodness. It leads to freedom. It leads to justice. It leads to redemption but it doesn't always lead to the place of safety. Which brings us to the last question. Which brings us to the last question. So again, uh, if you, like me, really want to be a part of that conversation with Jesus in the life to come and to be found as people who, in response to the question, did you help, answered yes. You've got to be available. We've got to be close enough to hear the cries of people and, and, and be, let our schedules be interrupted by them. And then thirdly and finally, we need to be able to answer this question. Are you doing your part? Are you doing your part? Now, I want to emphasize one particular word in yellow, your. Your. So often, one of the biggest obstacles, one of the things that holds people back from getting involved and helping when someone else is in distress is what I like to call the saturation effect. Saturation effect. How many of you have heard of something like this before, right? It's this idea that the higher your exposure to the world's issues, the world's pain, the world's problems, the higher exposed you are to those things, actually the less likely you are to get involved. And by the way, you live during a time in human history where you have the highest literal exposure to all of the world's problems. It's now not even just a matter of being on social media or not, or being on, having a smartphone or not just simply existing now. You encounter so many of the world's issues, infinite amount of world's issues in homelessness and poverty and in hunger and injustice. You name them. And I don't know about you, but the higher the exposure for me, sometimes the less likely I am to get involved. Why? Because a little voice starts chirping in my ear saying, who cares if you get involved or not? What difference are you going to make? And so the question is an interesting one. Are you doing your part? Are you doing your part? For those of you who are relatively newer to our church, uh, this weekend I've been especially inspired and especially just like blown away, quite frankly, by uh, our people's ability, your ability your desire to do your specific part. Just 24 hours ago, we had over 100 people gathered in this room packing meals for Rise Against Hunger. That's one of our partners that uh, where we get together, we pack thousands of meals and we send them all over the world to communities that are battling extreme hunger. 
simultaneously at the exact same time, uh, we had a, 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 very, very, a group of our uh, high school and middle school students gathered for their youth service weekend at places around town, uh, partnering and working with groups doing amazing work. This is a picture of us at Simple Gifts Community Garden. It's a community garden whereby they, we plant, we worked on, and we harvested food that actually goes to local food banks that gets in the homes, in the hands of people who are food and economically insecure. And what I love so much about what y'all did this weekend is that it reminded me that the best way to combat that saturation effect, that little voice that says, you can't do nothing to help nobody, little old you. Yesterday was kind of like an act of defiance and saying, I can do my part. In the words of the Japanese theologian Kangawa, I can clear my little corner of creation. And friends, that's it. That's it. And friends, it works. I think you need some good news today. You came here for good news, didn't you? You want some good news this morning? Here's the good news. If you commit to doing just your part, you mean like my part and their part? No, your part, just yours. If you commit to doing your part and everyone else who sees you do it says, you know what, I'm going to do my part and I'm going to do my part and I'm going to do my part, it works. In the, and I'll prove it to you. And particularly in the realm of global, worldwide, extreme hunger, extreme hunger, Raise your hands, okay, ready? Here we go, you're gonna do a thumb up, thumb in the middle, or thumb down. Do you think the situation with extreme hunger in our world is getting better, staying the same, or getting worse? Ready, I'm gonna make you vote. One, two, three, go. Extreme hunger in our world. Check it out. It's getting better. Year over year over year, extreme poverty is getting lower and lower and lower and lower, maybe not poverty altogether, but extreme poverty in our world is getting better. In fact, uh, sociologists predict by the time we reach about 20 years from now, extreme poverty could be gone. Maybe not poverty as a, in, by itself, but extreme poverty, gone. Because at some point we had had enough. And we as human beings collectively and individually said, I'm gonna do my part, you do your part, and maybe, just maybe, We'll get there. And we are. Slowly but surely. In this particular realm, we're extinguishing a little pocket of hell that's trying to live on earth. And friends, at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. I'll tell you what. The thing that gets me up in the morning every single day is the thought that I could partner with Jesus in ridding the world of all the versions of hell that continue to plague this place. That's the call. Is it to help people? Yes. Is it to jump up and support people? Yes. But the thing behind the thing is each and every time we do that, we're extinguishing the flames of hell on this place. We're making heaven more and more and more real. And I don't know about you, man, but I think about this as a pastor all the time. Sometimes I sit with this question, like, man, I wonder why Jesus, Jesus hasn't come back yet. I wonder why we haven't had this second coming moment yet where he comes and restores and redeems this whole thing. Like, I wonder, sometimes I wonder, like, man, I wonder why it hasn't happened yet. And in moments like these, I ponder that maybe the reason for that is not because of him. Maybe he's waiting on us. Maybe he's waiting. Just like the first time when inaugurating that kingdom of God, the first time he came, it took work. Maybe Jesus is waiting on you, waiting on me to do our part to usher that heavenly reality more and more into this place. Maybe, just maybe. Maybe, just maybe. The question isn't, if Jesus is ready to come back. But are we? Are we ready to join 
in that work, in that future world, right now. Thank you for listening to the Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.